please join me in welcoming our homegrown Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble. Good afternoon. Now, I'm of the African-American persuasion, and there's something called call and response, where, that, uh, where someone says, good afternoon, the congregation, which is you, <laughs> responds, because we're all here together. Okay, so I'm going to start again. Good afternoon. Thank you. And that's one of the first lessons about being a Hampshire student, open your mouth. <laughs> Thank you, Sig, for such you know, a, a wonderful introduction. And you know, sometimes you know, when people say all these things that I've done, the last part is, and she went to Hampshire? Question mark. Yes, I went to Hampshire. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. It should, that's right. It should be exclamation point and not a question mark. You know, I am very happy and proud to be this year's convocation speaker. And I have some heavy lifting to do here because I look out on the audience and see people who've known me since I was 17 years old. I am no longer 17 years old. As Sig was telling you how long it was that he's graduated, add a few more years, and that's when I graduated. And I, and I want to thank Jonathan Lash uh, for this invitation because it really does mean a lot to me to be back here at Hampshire. For most of this year, I've been working on my next book, a dual biography of two black women physician activists, Dr. Virginia Alexander and Dr. Dorothy Farabee, both of whom went to medical school in 1920 when there were 65 black women physicians practicing in the United States. My interest in writing about their lives and careers stems from elements of my own personal and professional biography. As a black woman social activist and a physician, I want to know more about my professional foremothers whose accomplishments and struggles paved the way for my entrance into medicine. To be sure, both Alexander and Farabee had major accomplishments, including, con including conducting research to improve the health status of African Americans, opening clinics and hospitals, and speaking out against racism in medicine but they also encounter obstacles, such as being denied internships because of their race and gender. Dr. Farabee once said that she was last of the last in medical school because she was not only a woman, but an African American. Actually, there have been times over the past few years when I thought that my next book should have been entitled what part of no can I say? However, this year, as I have become very engaged, I mean, obsessed, if you will, is probably a better description with finishing my book, I have become very practiced in saying no, and have indeed turned down several speaking engagements. Then in July, I got an email from Jonathan. He very politely asked me about the status of my writing project and then asked me whether I would be the keynote speaker at today's convocation. I must admit that I initially hesitated, but agreed largely because I did not want to pass up the opportunity to come back to Hampshire. As convocation approached, I began to panic. What was I going to talk about? It has been my experience that the best convocation speeches should be like the best commencement speakers, inspirational, witty, and mercifully short. <laughs> In addition, they should also remind us of what is the purpose or, or the mission of an educational, of educational insp institution. 
As I pondered my dilemma, I once again found inspiration from one of my two ladies, as I have affectionately begun to call Dr. Alexander and Dr. Farabee. The answer to the theme for, my, for today's talk came from a March 1938 speech that Dr. Virginia Alexander gave at Howard University to encourage black women to seek professional and vocational opportunities. The title of her talk was The Lore of Courageous Living. As I pondered the title of her talk, I soon realized that I had the theme for today's talk, and that is the importance of courageous learning. I think that such a theme is particularly fitting for Hampshire College because the lure of courageous learning is what has led many of us to this campus. And I think that courageous learning is a foundation of this college and should continue to be supported. To illustrate what I mean by courageous learning, let me begin with how I first came to Hampshire in 1970 as a member of its first class and briefly tell you about my professional life. I attended the Philadelphia High School for Girls, an academically prestigious magnet school, and I had done extremely well there. I was the class president, an honor student, and winner of the Latin Prize. That's when I thought that being a doctor, you need to learn Latin. That's changed, um, so I'm working on my Spanish. Thus, I had had multiple options for college, especially at a time when many institutions had initiated efforts to diversify their student bodies. My teachers at Girls High expected me to go to Yale, Princeton, Harvard, or if I wanted to stay in a single-sex institution, Smith or Mount Holyoke. When I decided to come to Hampshire, I had teachers stopping me in the hallway to tell me that I was ruining my life by coming here. <laughs> they were concerned that it was going to be risky to come to an unaccredited school that did not have a track record. But in September 1970, I, along with 267 other students, arrived on this campus. For me, it was the first time that I had been away from home for an, un for an extended period. The first time I had been north of Connecticut. I had had my Hampshire interview in Philadelphia and had never set foot on the college until opening day. And boy, was I surprised to find that there were no doorknobs on some of the dorm rooms and no curtains. My mother, who could out Martha Martha Stewart, was even more surprised. <laughs> Coming to Hampshire was also the first time that I had lived in a rural, predominantly white community. I did ask my mother not to leave until I saw another black person. I saw one and decided to stay, but then I found some others. <laughs> um, why did I decide to come to Hampshire? And why did I thrive here? Sometimes I flippantly respond that youthful idealism brought me to Hampshire. But that is not an accurate answer. I was attracted by Hampshire's academic philosophy of active learning, critical thinking, interdisciplinary work, and independent study. In addition, attending Hampshire appealed to my risk-taking, pioneering spirit, a faculty, a, trait, a spirit that was a common trait of those of, of, of us, not just students, but faculty who first came to Hampshire. I have wanted to be a physician since I was six years old. I think that I would have been a physician no matter what college I attended. But by attending Hampshire, I gained a new perspective on American medicine. I began to view medicine in its broader context as a social system that reflected the social, economic, and political views of the wider society. Indeed, in my Division II contract, I wrote that I was pre-social medicine. 
In addition to my medical school requirements, I took courses in medical sociology, medical economics, public health, and comparative health systems. I wrote a paper in the early 1970s about the health system in Cuba, and I finally, Maddie, tell Bob, I finally made it to Cuba to look at the health system last year. My academic journey received a measurable support from the faculty at Hampshire who never questioned my academic choices, even if they had never even heard of the term social medicine. My Division III project reflected this growing interest in the social aspects of medicine. On July 26, 1972, while sitting in the dining commons, I read about the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, or what I think should be called the United States Public Health Syphilis Study in Tuskegee, because it more accurately reflects the sponsorship of the study. For my Division III project, I wrote a history of the syphilis study in which the public health service from 1932 to 1972 intentionally withheld treatment for syphilis from approximately 400 black men, many of whom were poor, who lived in Macon County, Alabama. My friends like to joke that I have been milking my Division III thesis for almost 40 years. I just think they're jealous that they didn't choose as well as I did. <laughs> In some respects, they are right, because my analysis of the syphilis study begun here at Hampshire has shaped the core of my professional life. It has led me to study the history of race and racism in American medicine, to found one of the first academic centers to address racial and ethnic inequities in health and healthcare, and to lead the committee that uh, played the lead role in obtaining an apology from President Clinton for the syphilis study. I think that these intellectual and political actions reflect an ethos that I learned at Hampshire and that is reflected in one interpretation of its motto, non satisfactory to know is not enough, namely that knowledge should be tied to social action and policy. And I see Lynn Miller standing uh, in the back, and if I pass my vetting, I, my next uh, federal appointment will be on uh, a committee looking at uh, sickle cell disease in the uh, federal government, uh, the advisory board, and the National Institutes of Health. And the reason why I pointed out Lynn is that my interest in sickle cell disease started from a seminar paper I wrote for him. Uh, so I, so a lot of the things that I, and I do new, do th new things, but a lot of the things that I learned, I have learned here at Hampshire. I don't just keep retreading. After I graduated from Hampshire, I went down another uncharted path. I entered an MD PhD program in the history and sociology at of science at the University of Pennsylvania. Pursuing a dual degree in medicine and the social sciences was indeed a rarity in 1974, and receiving funding from the National Institutes of Health was even more so. Some of my colleagues in the MD-PhD program, most of whom were getting their PhDs, um, uh, degrees in the biological sciences, told me that I should not, they told me this to my face, that I should not have been admitted to the program because my interest in the social sciences had no place in medicine, that it was useless. I did want to uh, write some of them personal notes when I was elected to the Institute of Medicine long before they were elected to the Institutes of Medicine, but that would have been rubbing it in, and I'm not the vindictive type. Um, I must admit a sense of accomplishment when I read earlier this year that starting in 2015, the medical college admissions tests would include questions in the behavioral and social sciences. As the president of the Association of American Medical Co uh, Colleges put it, the sig and I quote, we signal we're trying to, 
to sin is while medical school requires this solid grounding in the life sciences, it also requires a broader, more human, humanistic, social-oriented perspective, end quote. When I read about these revisions in the, Amer in the medical college admissions test, the first person I contacted was Bob Vonderlip, a retired Hampshire College sociology professor who had first prompted my interest in medicine and the social sciences. Bob responded, I guess those kinds of good ideas take a long time to, set, to sink in. A few years ago, a friend of mine from medical school asked me if I had any idea what my professional path would look like when I decided to combine medicine and the social sciences. I told him that I did not have the slightest idea, but I, I figured it would work out somehow. He responded that he thought that my decision to go out of the norm of medicine was indeed a brave one. As I have said, I wanted to discuss the importance of courageous learning. But what are the elements of courageous learning? First, I think we need to acknowledge that for much of American history, that the pursuit of learning itself by many groups was not just a courageous act, but a revolutionary one. My elementary school teachers in West Philadelphia realized that prevailing social values often devalued the lives and potentials of African-American children. They saw education as an antidote to these attitudes and believed that education could change destinies. They reminded us that it was once illegal in this country for enslaved African-Americans to be educated and that it was indeed an act of resistance for the enslaved to learn to read. I grew up with images of black students trying to desegregate schools in the South, accompanied by white jeering mobs and federal troops only because they wanted to have an education. Historically, there have been obstacles to women pursuing education. I remember a friend of mine, a wealthy white woman, who told me the story of how one of her female ancestors had to run away from home in the early 20th century in order to get an education. Today, population development organizations have identified educating women and girls as one of the most effective factors in reducing global po poverty. Yet, according to recent statistics from the United, State, and United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, approximately 67 million children remain out of school across the globe, and over half of them are girls. Girls across the globe are frequently barred from schools, educated in clandestine circumstances, or face physical risks in order to be educated. I am also concerned about the growing obstacles to education in our own country. Budgets for public education are being slashed. The cost of post-secondary education are rising. Liberal arts education is vilified. And in some quarters, the quest for a college education is devalued and even ridiculed. In addition, there are immense, immense educational barriers for students who are undocumented immigrants. I was proud to learn that Hampshire has taken action and has started a scholarship fund to help such students. This is clearly... This is clearly not the time to be silent about the importance of education as a social justice issue. One of the most critical elements of a Hampshire education and of courageous learning is developing the skills to trek and bushwhack uncharted paths. The hiking metaphor is not accidental. I took my first hike ever here on the Holyoke Range. It was on a bright February day, warm by New England standards, but it was still February. It was Saturday, 
and a group of friends said, let's go climb Mount Holyoke. I said, sure, I'm game. Mind you, as I said, I had never gone hiking in my entire life. And at the time, I did not particularly like to exercise. But for some reason, I wanted to go on this hike. So I went to get prepared for the hike and came out with my boots. Well, these boots were the type of boots that I would be wearing in downtown Philadelphia. You know, boots with heels. <laughs> I had never heard of Ella Bean uh, or Eastern Mountain Sports. Well, off I went tipping in my boots and started to climb. What a disaster. I did not get far before the first hill broke off, then the second. Although it was a nice day, there was snow on the hill and an icy crust that I kept falling through. There were times where I was really afraid, but I continued the hike and made it back to campus, literally battered and bruised and I had the help of a friend helping me down. I remember that the hike was on a Saturday because in those days, long ago, shrimp and steak were served on the dining commons every Saturday night. <laughs> also, there was going to be a big party that night. I missed both the dinner and the party and I was in bed wondering why in the world I had gone on that hike. I guess that I should add that with persistence and tenacity and many, many falls, my hiking skills have improved. I am now a very good hiker and indeed am leaving on a hiking trip to Mexico on Friday. Needless to say, my hiking boots have deep treads. <laughs> I think that there are some links between hiking and courageous learning. With both, there are times when you must trek and bushwhack through uncharted paths. You need to take risks. That path may, as with the case of the faculty, students, staff, and administration who first came to Hampshire, lead to making of a college. It might be learning a new skill or a body of knowledge for some of you today here. It is living away from home for the first time, or living in a new country, or being the first in your family to go to college. But no matter the path, you need to embrace the thrill of the new adventure. But as was the case with my initial disastrous hike on the Holyoke Range and the subsequent more pleasurable ones, I have come to understand that courageous learners figure out what they need to do to succeed ask for help when they need it, continue to persist, and get up when they fall down. Before I end my talk, I would like to discuss two other elements of courageous learning, a commitment to lifelong learning and self-reflection. There's no end point in education, but rather it's a continuous process. Co courageous learners figure out when to speak up when to ask questions, perhaps to ask the questions that other people are afraid to ask. And with your, your, your example of you know, what is literacy, that's one of those questions I guarantee. There are other people in the room who probably did not know what literacy was, but was afraid to ask. So continue to ask questions. Courageous learners also can need to figure out when to be silent to listen, to hear, and to hear what other people have to say. Courageous learners question and critique accepted knowledge, but they also understand that they need to question and critique their own actions. They embrace self-reflection because it helps them to acknowledge their strengths, weaknesses, mistakes, and biases. They understand that change can only come with self-critique. No matter, what's one's, no matter one's age or profession, learning new things can be disruptive. It takes one out of one's comfort zone because it might call for one to rethink one's worldview or to acknowledge a lack of, of expertise or to admit that you're wrong. Let me illustrate my point with an example of courageous learning from medical education. 
Two friends of mine, Drs. Melanie Turvalon and Dr. Jan Murray Garcia, have developed an educational concept called cultural humility to train physicians to better address the health needs of an increasingly multicultural America. The model calls for physicians to acknowledge the power imbalances in the doctor-patient relationship and to relinquish the role of expert to the patient and that the doctor becomes the student to the patient, which sometimes happens in the classroom where the student becomes the teacher. One of, for me, one of the most learning experiences I had was from a student who I always ask, when students tell me something, I always say, well, why do you believe that? Tell me why you believe that. And I had written an article which I didn't have my students read. And he says, I, he said, why? I said, it's kind of personal. He says, well, it is published. So it's like, well, you know, people are reading it. And he thought that my being open would help, you know, talking about my personal experiences in life with racism would help students to understand. And so because of a student, when I teach my course on the history of race and racism in American medicine, I always put it in the place where he told me. He told me, don't put it in the front of the first few weeks where people are too intimidated by me, but then they get to know me. But um, cultural, they still might be intimidated, but they know what I don't bite. Uh, the cultural humility model critiques traditional medical education where physicians are told that they are the experts. Being able to say, I don't know, can be scary and humbling, and not just for physicians. But at the same time, it can be intellectually exhilarating because it might help one start the journey towards learning something new or walking down an unknown path. Yes, courageous learners confront their fears, but keep going. As the writer Anais Nin has said, it takes courage to push yourself to places where you have never been to test your limits and break through barriers. At Hampshire's first convocation on October 3, 1970, the late poet Archibald MacLeish forcefully and eloquently voiced his support for Hampshire its ideals, and the importance of a liberal arts education. He proclaimed what is new and newly exciting about this occasion is precisely the sense of departure, of adventure, of voyage. So as this new year begins, be brave, be bold, break barriers, and make sure that Hampshire College remains a place where courageous learning is part of the adventure. Thank you very much.